Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, I would like to start by acknowledging the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation as traditional owners of the land on which we meet this evening, and we pay our respects to their elders, past, present, and emerging. Uh, my name is Professor Russ Hoy, and it's my privilege to serve as Dean of the School of Allied Health, Human Services and Sport at the Trobe University. And it's with great pleasure that I introduce this evening's uh, bold discussion about a field that has transformed so many lives. The need for prosthetics and orthotics remains high today, with some 8,000 lower limb amputations performed in Australia each year. Beyond restoring personal freedom, the evolution in body technology means that artificial limbs have the power to enhance and redesign the human experience. So how can we ensure that everyone benefits from such technological advances? This is one of the many questions we'll be putting to our panel members tonight. Uh, first on the panel is Associate Professor in Prosthetics and Orthotics at La Trobe University, Michael Dillon. His research is focused on patient outcomes after lower limb amputation and individual experience of limb loss. This research is being used to build resources that can help people facing difficult decisions about amputation. Joining him is prosthetic art curator and amputee Priscilla Sutton, and you can probably guess which one she is on the panel here. She is one in a cluster of babies <laughs> born in regional Queensland with health challenges attributed to a chemical used in farming across Australia. At the age of 26 and following years of pain, she chose to amputate her right leg below the knee and considers it the best decision of her life. And Priscilla has taken her prosthetics exhibition, Spare Parts, around the world. Our third panellist is Mandy McCracken. She is the co-founder of the Quad Squad, an international support group for quadruple amputees and help establish the disability support group uh, within the Mitchell Shire. She is passionate about breaking down barriers for people with disabilities and regularly shares her experiences through motivational speaking, writing and media opportunities. And completing our panel tonight is La Trobe alumna and senior clinician at ProMotion Prosthetics, Monique Vandenboom. Monique has worked in both private and public systems in Australia and overseas and provided volunteer prosthetic services to people affected by the devastating 2010 earthquake in Haiti. She currently sits on the board of the Australian Orthotic and Prosthetic Association. Please join me in welcoming the panel. <laughs> uh, and you probably guess the man in the middle, Tonight's host is broadcaster and journalist Francis Leach, and he'll, be kick, he'll kick off the discussion after a short video, voiced by Priscilla, which offers a snapshot of how the field of prosthetics has evolved over time. Prosthetics have transformed lives for decades. Back in the day, injured soldiers got tin legs shipped in from England. And if it didn't fit, well, that's another story. As soldiers came home with their limbs missing, they were often retrained as lift operators or posties. To meet this rise in demand, the industry was born in Australia and cobblers took it on as a new trade. But eventually it moved into a formal health sciences degree and La Trobe University was the first to teach this in the country. But let's just say things weren't always exactly trendy. Thankfully, designs have improved over the decades and gained some personality and some attitude. New technologies such as 3D printing are changing the way we design and manufacture devices. So, will we all become our own body architects in the future? Good evening, everybody, and welcome here to the NGV for tonight's discussion. My name is Francis Leach. Thank you to, to Russell Hoy for the introduction. Uh, and thank you for being here. The format for the Bold Thinking series is an hour of discussion with our panellists and then we'll take half an hour of questions from the floor afterwards. There's some strict rules around that too. You can ask one question and a follow-up, no statements. This is not a place for, uh, for a campaigning from the floor. It is about discussion, listening <laughs> and learning. So let's start with what is everybody's story up here that has had to come to terms with living as an amputee. And Priscilla, I'll start with you. Um, not many people have had to face the decision you had to face, but you said it was the best decision of your life. Tell us your journey to that decision. I guess uh, for me, I was born without 
the, my fibula, so the outer bone between your knee and your ankle, um, my leg was quite thin um, because of that. And when I was born, my, my foot was facing up and it was um, broken and fused to face down. And I had worn orthopedic boots um, up until the age of 26. And, um, and it was when I was living in Tokyo and I was just experiencing such chronic pain. And I like to describe it as um, you have muscle pain and bone pain. And for me, I was experiencing bone pain. So when you get to that point in the day that your bones start hurting, for me, that just put a stop and I, that was it for the day. So wherever I was, I would find a taxi and go home. Um, and once I chose to amputate my leg, uh, my life completely changed. And now if I'm a bit tired, um, say I'm in the supermarket and I'm a bit worn out, I can go outside, sit down, have a coffee, pop my leg off, just like anybody with some shoes that are annoying them, and I can recover because it's more of a muscular pain now if I experience any at all. And, uh, and I feel really lucky. So for me, it was the best decision of my life because it opened, it, uh, opened up the world for me. I have less physical restrictions. Um, and of course, we all know anybody who's experienced chronic pain, the impact that can have on your mental health as well. So for me, um, it was the best decision of my life. So even on the days that might be a bit harder, it was still a great thing to do. So in a way, what you're describing there was before the operation, your injury or your problem with your leg actually defined your entire experience because it was governed by that. When it was too much, you had to stop. It was the, the universe in which you lived. Uh, and you were liberated from your leg mm -hmm. in a way that maybe when people presume and look at you would not know. No, there's always an assumption yeah. of pity, actually, when you see amputees, which is really heartbreaking. And people say, I'm, oh, I'm so sorry. And I think, oh, I'm not. You should see what I had before. It was pretty <laughs> rubbish. I mean, bless my old leg. I, I love her dearly. And um, we had a great relationship. And she got me through 26 years of my life. And I'll always remember her fondly. But she's retired. OK, so. you let me down this part. <laughs> we have to tell the story now that you did have a relationship with your leg and uh, you also um, had a very special goodbye to your leg. Yes. Do you want to tell people what you did? So in the lead up to my surgery, so when, when you have elective surgery like this, you, you don't just go into the doctor and say, right, chop it off today, get rid of it. It's a long process and it's through public health system and, and there's lots of paperwork and appointments and decisions and consultations and then you go on a wait list and we're pretty lucky in Australia, the wait list isn't too long um, in, in most places and um, when I finally got the letter to say your surgery's in three weeks, of course I started to panic because it's not like cutting your hair off, it doesn't grow back. And even though you know it's the right decision, you do start to doubt yourself a bit. So I decided to go to uh, some therapy. I went to a psychologist who also did some hypnotherapy. And I'm a pretty sceptical person, but I went in with a really open mind um, because she specialised in relaxation. So I did this session with her and it was called Talking to Your Body. And I sat back and I kind of... Um, went through this whole process of a conversation with my body, which I know sounds a bit hippy-dippy and people think it's strange, but I, ha I was not there. I was watching myself and listening to myself. I was absolutely bawling. I had tears coming down. Everything was just drenched. And in that conversation with my body, my leg told me that she was angry and sad because I was chopping her off and throwing her away after everything we had been through. And that experience led me to um, the decision to cremate my leg when it was amputated. So I went back to my doctor and said, um, I'd like to cremate my leg. And he didn't know if they were allowed to do that. So um, he rang the legal unit of the hospital and um, said to the lawyer, you know, I've um, got this young woman, she's about to have her leg amputated and she'd like to cremate it, are we allowed to do that? And the lawyer said, what is she effing nuts? <laughs> and he said, no, and she's here and you're on speakerphone. <laughs> <laughs> and, and we all laughed, I think the lawyer was a bit freaked out and panicked. Um, and we were allowed to do it, but there were some rules around it, my leg had to be collected within an hour of surgery and all of this stuff, otherwise I'd be charged morgue fees because that's how Queensland Health is. And um, bless them. And, um, and so on the day I was getting, you know, I was in the anaesthetist room and I was getting all the drugs and my surgeon came in and he said, hey, Priscilla, have you called your funeral home? 
And I said, yeah, yeah, it's all good. Every, everyone's calling, it's all. And he walked out and everyone was like, what the hell was that? The guy who's about to amputate your leg is making sure you've organised your funeral. Um, but all around, it was a really great experience for me. Um, the funeral home, when I rang to get a quote, thought it was a prank call. Because <laughs> they said I wanted to know how much it would cost. Because what if it was really expensive and I couldn't afford it? So, and, and they said, we don't know. We haven't had that before. And I said, well, it's no bigger than a cat. How much would you charge to cremate a cat? And so we settled on the price of a cat, which at the time was like a couple hundred bucks. Um, and so they collected my leg, and then I had, to, well, I had to go in and fill out paperwork, and I still have it. And it, instead of deceased person's name, it's leg of Priscilla. And it was all very funny, but, um, and it's a great story that I'll tell forever, but um, it was actually the most beautiful form of closure because I still have my leg in ashes and, um, and I know what happened to her and uh, she can forever be with me and I'll always be grateful of the 26 years of hard work that she gave me. Mandy, your experience is the, the reverse of that, isn't it? Because, well, uh, Priscilla's was um, a moment of liberation, yours was a moment of deep trauma. Uh, that came, whereas Priscilla had to consi had time to consider the consequences and and, just, and and think about and have a relationship with her leg. Uh, you weren't afforded any of that. No, my uh, my introduction to amputation was I woke up after a coma, uh, a ten day coma, to discover that my hands and feet had died and had turned black. So yeah, there was no choice involved with me. Um, I, I unfortunately got um, sepsis through a blood infection, and yeah, it was it was the other end of the stick. Yeah, so um, I didn't have any turning back. I didn't have any fun thing. Well, I mean, you know, there's always great stories in the amputee world, that's for sure. But um, yeah, it was quite different. For for both of you, um, it was about reimagining or coming to terms with a different way to live and a different sense of self. Hmm. How long did that take for you to come to terms with, or are you still coming ah, to terms with it? Well, I am still coming to terms with it all. Um, again, a great psych got me through all this, and I think anybody who goes through something as traumatic as losing all four limbs um, without a psychologist is mad out there. <laughs> Anyone I and I do know quite a few amputees. Um, multiple limb amputees that believe that they can do it without um, psychological assistance, and I think you're, you're insane. Um, what was the question? Oh, just, <laughs> did you, how it changes your sense of self and the way that you, you'd imagined your, your relationship with your body and who you were as you a person. You know what was really interesting? So I spent so much time in, be in a bed, um, and then when I got out of the bed, I was in a wheelchair, and then, you know, it was months until I got given legs to stand up on. So I'd actually never seen myself without my limbs because I could never stand in front of a mirror. I could only ever see from this up, in, this high up in front of a mirror in a hospital. So um, I never actually had a sense of what I looked like without limbs. And the fortunate part was is I had a lovely prosthetist who gave me limbs. And, you know, I stood up in front of a mirror and I was all sort of put back together again. So um, probably... The first time that I saw myself without limbs, I was in a dress shop. Um, we had a dinner dance to go to and I needed an outfit. And so my husband pulled me apart literally in a dressing shop and put, me, put a dress on me and stood me in front of a mirror and I didn't have my arms on. And I've gone, hang on a tick, this looks really weird. And so I went and found my prosthetic arms and I put them back on again and went, oh, there you go, we're, we're back together again. So it's been quite a process and I saw Priscilla on the telly recently and you were talking about, you know, showing your medal and up until that time I'd had covers on my legs that looked like natural legs. So, you know, for me to now come around with, with this look is actually a really big mental step that's actually only been in the last couple of months. Michael, when we talk about the journey that both Priscilla and Mandy have been on, and it would have been very different generations ago, but is the medical profession and the, uh, the industry around it that supports people who are living with amputation getting better at understanding the relationship between uh, replacing their limbs and the person, the, the holistic nature of the experience they're going through? Yeah, I, I, I think absolutely. I think um, uh, there's been a lot of research done then looking at um, the, certainly the experience of, of making decisions about amputation surgery. And I think um, the difference in uh, Priscilla's and Mandy's stories really speaks to the importance of, um, or, or the great opportunity that's there if you can make that um, an informed choice. And I think um, particularly when people have the capacity to make 
uh, that sort of informed choice, then they often feel um, very different about uh, what the outcome might be. Um, and I think then um, when we talk with people about those experiences, absolutely, um, how people come to terms with uh, the way they feel about their prosthesis. Um, I think Mandy's uh, story really says it all in terms of uh, being able to um, imagine yourself uh, as a prosthesis user and it feels a part of yourself and when it's not there, it's, it feels uh, weird. It feels a bit strange. I, I think Mandy sums it up much better than I can. But traditionally, did, uh, did surgeons lead? Or did they feel it was their role as experts to tell uh, amputees what they needed? And is, is that relationship, is that power balance changing? Yeah, that paternalistic relationship is, is absolutely changing. Um, uh, but, but it's a slow process. Um, certainly, um, in our experiences of people where we've interviewed people about their experience of losing a limb, um, people often describe that the choice was made for them. Mm. That, um, you know, they, they come in and there's a ward round and a surgeon comes in or a doctor comes in and says, well, you know, this isn't, this ulcer isn't healing or this gangrene isn't going to resolve, so we've booked you in for some surgery. Uh, and uh, sort of walk out and move on to the next person in the next ward, um, you know, with, without really a, a conversation. Um, and I think the, the thing that we've gathered from talking with people is the thing that they really value most is a meaningful conversation. Um, and I think in lots of other areas of healthcare, um, people do that much better. So certainly in um, a cancer treatment, uh, where people have access often to genetic counsellors, to so say particularly for things like breast cancer treatment. Um, those studies absolutely look um, and describe the value of that meaningful conversation. And sometimes it's not even in the here and now, sometimes it's just having some idea about what's down the, down the road. And even if you can't um, predict for a person whether there are going to be complications down the road or what those complications might be, just knowing that the path ahead might look a little bumpy um, often helps prepare people and, and when people have that preparation they often experience much less depression and anxiety um, down the track. So. Well, again, in, in the design and, um, and the evolution of prosthetics, and we saw the footage of the World War I soldiers coming home and, uh, and what their experience was, you look at the, the, the change now, uh, uh, do you think that the technology is empowering people to make better choices, the fact that we've come so far, particularly for, for people, but is cost the barrier to actually having what you want? Um, yeah, a couple of good questions. So, I, definitely, I mean, I wasn't a prosthetist back in the war, of the war days, but um, definitely things have changed drastically since then. And even in the 15, 20 years that I've been within the prosthetic um, field, I've seen a massive shift in people's um, prosthetic users' um, desire of what they want that prosthetic limb to look like. And it's so, give of, us a sense of that. What, what, what so, it that? used to be very much, like Mandy said, wanted it, you know, to look like her leg, you know, shaped and colour matched and very important to be symmetrical and um, whereas I think in more recent times there's been a real shift in what wearing a prosthetic limb means and the self-image part of it that, that you know, is behind that. Um, people's, uh, you know, opinion of what their self-image is has shifted, I think, and it doesn't have to be that their prosthetic leg looks exactly like their other leg or what their leg was before. So there's definitely been a big shift. And I think that, um, yeah, what's driving that? I think probably exposure, you know, exhibitions um, that are put on and people out there wearing prosthetic limbs that have, you know, funky 3D printed covers or cosmetic covers or even just without any covers so that you see what the, you know, the actual components. Um, and the more robotic look, that's been accepted a lot more. And so I think that just, you know, there's a momentum behind that because people are proud and, and they sort of show it off and, and that gets um, collected by other prosthetic users. Um, and definitely the introduction of new technology helps because the new technology is often so functional that it's not cosmetic anymore. And so in order to get that function, people just embrace the fact that it looks pretty cool and it works really well. Well, I'll talk about cost in a while because I think that falls into the issue of the NDIS and a few other major issues that we're going to discuss. But I am interested in the changing nature and aesthetic of prosthetics. And, and uh, Monique talked about what she's seen in her time in, in, in the industry and the whole notion of show your metal and the idea that rather than trying to blend in and be like everyone else, you can wear your prosthetic as a statement of your experience, of who you, who you are f through your experience. And yes, this is who I am. Is that something that you came naturally to, Priscilla, or did you also have to... Did you, were, you, were you trying to, you know, blend in before you decided to 
where you're at on your on your prosthesis? Well, having had a leg that never a right leg that never looked like my left leg, when I first started wearing prosthetics, I was obsessed with having a leg that looked like my left leg. So I was all about the fake skin and the shape and everything like that and wearing tights, oh my God. Tights, <laughs> if you think about tights on a, on a pole leg, it looks the same on a leg without a fibula, it's just baggy, it doesn't work. So I was really excited about um, that shape and, uh, and I had all of these skins that, they, they were rubbish, they just would, as soon as they started to tear, it looked like a dog had chewed it and I'd be like, well, I don't feel as proud with my leg. And then I started to get more active as well because I couldn't do a lot of exercise previously. And so then I realised, actually, it's a bit heavy and clunky, this, all this fake skin and the shape. So I decided, and this was in 2010, um, to get a colourful leg. And I was really inspired by a little girl in my prosthetic clinic. Um, young Zoe was five years old and sitting next to me for a fitting. And, and um, she was just renowned for having really bright, beautiful legs. And she was holding court with all these grown-ups around her who were waiting to hear what her next leg would look like. And she made the big announcement, this tiny girl with all these grown-ups, and she said, Dora the Explorer. And they all went, no problem. And I'm like, I want a Dora leg. How do I do this? <laughs> and so I, I remember this experience so well because I, I went to Spotlight, I chose a piece of fabric, and for five bucks, it completely changed my life. I'm sure that the clinic were having bets how long I would last with a pole leg that was polka dot. Um, but it completely changed me. And that experience, I didn't... It's not just... Um, what did it change for you? What, what you say it changed you? What did it change? For you? So for me, um, there was the physical element of it, where it's actually lighter to wear um, what I just dub a pole leg. So it's much lighter, more comfortable in lots of different ways. Um, but also, if my favourite example is walking into a supermarket, mm -hmm. and it used to be little kids would see me and say to their mum, like, "Hey, mum, look at that lady's fake leg," and the kid you know, the mum would grab their elbow and say, shut up, don't say anything, don't stare, and it would be really awkward. And instead, the first time I walked into a supermarket wearing a polka dot leg, this little girl in a polka dot dress was like holding it, looking at me, and couldn't articulate, your leg matches my dress and this is really <laughs> weird. And instead of the parent pulling her away, they were like, hey, your leg's beautiful. And I was like, thank you. <laughs> and it was this moment of like my aha moment where I went, wow, five bucks just completely changed the public's, like a stranger's perception of me. The pity went away and the fear and the taboo. And instead of that, it was appreciation and it was colour. And it was, it was just this whole new moment. And then I, I have never looked back. And now I have a pole leg under this and this is a a cover that is just held on by magnets yep. that I can pull off. Um, so my pole leg has lovely fabric on it and then I have this, and there's magnets embedded in the top. And then I can put that on when I want to, which is pretty cool. And I upped the ante from Spotlight and now an amazing <laughs> um, couple of artists from America, Mark Ryden and Marion Peck, um, keep me in artwork because they love this and this is one of Marion Peck's works young Lord Oliver. Um, and this was just a dream that I had because it used to be when I started doing this that it had to be two legs. You had to have a full shape and a pole leg and that was kind of it 10 years ago. And, um, and, and I asked my prosthetist to make my dream come true. Um, I love Mandy. I know, they're so elegant. So beautiful. <laughs> and I, for me, I kind of... Because the 3D printing ones I love so much and they're so... Expensive. They're expensive. <laughs> so is this one. It's it's a very expensive hobby, isn't it? Um, yeah. But it's I, what I really wanted was that full shape for wearing tights. Yeah. It's and it and you have to and this is a big part of the choice and control and those conversations, is prosthetists actually having a conversation with their clients, because it's not about what we're given. It's about what we want, yeah. and it's about the activity levels. It's about aesthetics. What clothes do you want to wear? Um, for some men, it might be, and women as well, um, wearing jeans, it's about filling out the, the pant leg. Um, and for me, it's about wearing the tights. So, uh, and that for me was my priority with my cosmetics. So, 
Yeah. Uh, Can I just? Yes, please. Mm -hmm. I was. Um, I couldn't help but notice in the way that you told parts of that story that it sounds like when you had a prosthesis with a cover and it's a bit ratty and mm. you know, falling apart. That actually, uh, the way you described it, it sounded like you're embarrassed. Yeah. And then you know, as you uh, sort of, I guess, took ownership of what you wanted your prosthesis to look like and had more control, it, that that tone really disappeared. Is that sort of it true does. to that experience? Yeah. And for me, when I had my original leg as well, I lived in jeans and boots. I very much hid my body. Um, and then when I um, first had a prosthetic, it was all about blending in and having that fake skin. And for some reason now, my attitude has completely changed. So colour changed other people's perceptions, but also my own perception of myself. It helped me realise that you, there's opportunity in adversity, embracing your body um, and, you know, letting your life and your personality shine through your accessories which is what we do with necklaces and earrings and jumpers and shirts and dresses, and I can do that with my leg. So it completely changed that, and I was really lucky to have the support of clinicians who supported that, yeah. which was really great. Can I, can I add to that? Yeah. One thing with the rattiness, mm. like the two of us do a lot of public speaking, you know, when you're getting up in front of a crowd and you're wearing a cover mm. that has been torn to shreds, you can't clean it up. Like, mm. you know, once once your your skins and things get worn and used up, there's no sort of you can't get the scrub out and clean it up or a layer of nail polish doesn't really do much when your fingers are literally <laughs> splitting apart and Do you know what we need to do is draw a little dog that's been biting it <laughs> and, and turn it into an artwork. It into but it is a thing. It's yeah. um, and they're becoming more durable and when they're removable, yeah, even better. Were yeah. you a show your metal person or did you? No, no, this, this is my first <laughs> is he, set. Yeah, it's yeah, the first really? time I've worn heels in six years. Wow. Yeah. Um, no, as I said, I had these covers and then I would put a pair of lace-up sneakers on because they're beautiful to walk in. Yeah. Um, but it, it would ruin your ankle. So I, I had to live in my white lace-up sneakers because I could never take my sneakers off because my ankles were mangled. So did you also feel um, because if you... And you did set up a network and you've done this incredible job in connecting people who have had like experiences. But when you were first in your situation, did you feel not empowered to ask as if you should be grateful that you were alive at all and therefore... Well, you get given one set of legs. That's what I mean, yeah. And, and you should and be skins, grateful that you've got them. The skins are $800 for a single skin. Am I right? I'm right. Give or take. Like, you can't turn around and go, oh, I've put a hole in them. Can I have another set, please? You know, Medicare's lovely and looks after us, but that's probably a bit rich to ask for a second set of skins when you've only had them for a week and you've already ruined them. So, yeah, it's you you take what you've given and it, if it's not great, you sort of tend to just keep your mouth shut. And so, ha so how did you get to the point where you said, I needed to ex meet and talk to people who've had like experiences and, and how did you start building that network? Uh, so... For me, um, I was visited by um, people from Limbs for Life, which was brilliant. Yep. And um, I did actually have a quadruple amputee come and visit me in, in hospital when I was incredibly drugged up and didn't really remember much. But um, when I came out of hospital, um, another quadruple amputee, Matthew Ames, had been on TV and he's in Brisbane. And, you know, through the wonders of social media, we all found each other. And we organised to catch up at a pub when we were up in Queensland. And he happened to bring another quadruple amputee that he knew, um, Corinne Barrett. And we sat in this pub with our family, our you know, husbands and wives and our children. And finally I had found someone who had lived exactly the same thing I'd just been through. You know, they How had, did that feel at that moment? Oh, I, just, I had a thousand and one questions bouncing around in my head. Yeah. How did you do this? What happened when that happened? You know, um, Rod sat there and said, you know, how many lasagnas did you get? And we win. We got seven lasagnas at one stage. And, <laughs> you know, to be able to turn around and have that conversation with someone who understands when you're walking down the street and a stranger shoves $50 in your hand, like, just because they feel sorry for you. Like, how do you process that? And the exact same thing had happened to them. So we just, we connected through social media and now we've got, today it was 210 quadruple amputees around the world, which is nuts, like... You know, it's, it's a club. We're quite a club. Um, but we share, you know, how do you do your bra up? How do you put your hair up? Um, how do you brush your teeth? Um, Things you would otherwise have to try and work out on your own. Yeah, and, you know, it, it goes beyond what you learn from an OT in a hospital. You know, this, OTs in hospitals are great. They teach you how to eat and how to wipe your bum. 
they send you on your merry way. Um, but, you know, how do you oh, get money out of an ATM? Mm. You know, when you're doing this, how do you get money out of an ATM? Um, I've now learnt that I just bring children with me. <laughs> <laughs> do they do that as well? Yeah, all my kids know my <laughs> PIN numbers. Um, That's going to be dangerous later on, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but the value in, in having somebody else who's living exactly the same scenario is incredible. Uh, Monique, just on that, as people do connect and social media now allows people to share their experiences probably more widely than ever before, mm. is that having an impact in the world of design and manufacture as well as, as people on that side of the experience get to understand more and people advocating more loudly for what they want rather than yeah. what they have been told they need to have. Yeah, definitely. I think in, in two ways that I can think of. One would be it, it's making an impact on um, clients advocating for themselves and, and being very vocal about what they want because I've seen this thing on Instagram and I want yeah. a leg that looks yeah. like that. I want which, the Dora Explorer leg. Which, I want it now. <laughs> <laughs> which sometimes is great, sometimes is a little frustrating yeah. and, and especially with media too. You know, there's a lot of stories that are out there that um, maybe skirt around what the act, you know, whether or not it's actually commercially available but it just seems like it is so... I don't like having the conversations with clients that actually, yeah, that hand that you've seen doing this, it's not actually available yet. Like it's it's a prototype and, you know, but hopefully in the future. So there's that part of it. So the exposure online is massive and it's definitely um, changing clients, um, yeah, them being more vocal about what they want, which I think is great. Um, but then is it changing the design and the manufacture of um, products? Probably. I mean, I think that... Um, Clients are, again, being more vocal about what they want. I think that suppliers and R&D departments and things like that are probably listening a lot more because it's easier to hear what they're saying online and, you know, from feedback and things like that. So I'd hope that they listen and, and then take that into account in their design of componentry. And, Michael, that exposure to new technologies and the availability of, of progress with prosthesis, it's driving a consumer demand that maybe can't be met by a regulated industry that needs to deliver under a certain set of parameters, you know, that, that might take a little longer to get to where it needs to be. Yeah, um, I, I think the, for me, the thing that's sort of really come out of the bit Monique said is that idea that, you know, you've got a consumer-driven demand. And I think um, if we come back to that early idea that the way we, we provided a lot of prosthetic care was very paternalistic. So, you know, here's, here's a, a person and they have a baloney amputation and here's what a baloney prosthesis looks like and it's got one of three feet and it's going to look like this and, and that's what you'll have. Mm. Um, I think uh, increasingly what we've seen is people... Um, is we've seen a number of very innovative startups then really take um, control of trying to change that experience for people and I think... Um, uh, that there's a, a, a company in the UK, a startup, um, who've really done great work looking at how you design uh, 3D printed uh, parts for, for a prosthesis um, and parts that can then absolutely be tailor made to a person's individual wishes. Um, and I think uh, going forward, that the companies that can really uh, crack that, that can really do a good job of um, working with individual clients to figure out what it is that they want and configure out how you deliver that um, will be the companies who I think are really um, continue to be successful into the future. Um, so I think gone are the days of that paternalistic, you know, you need a prosthesis and here's what, here's what it is that you'll have. Is the regulatory framework that's currently in place holding that back? Um, no, I don't believe so. Um, I, I think for people who need a prosthesis, the, the regulatory framework is, is, actually, is, is in place for that. Um, I think people have, um, you know, access to a, um, to a funded, you know, a, a funded prosthetic service through the NDIS, you know, notwithstanding some of the challenges of um, how you access that system. Um, uh, you know, we have uh, clinicians who are um, trained and educated and regulated to provide those sorts of services. Um, and the technologies that sit behind that, the, the manufacturing parts of that, um, like the 3D printing, are absolutely there to support the provision of a, of a, a clinical service. Um, so I, I think in an, in an environment that's well regulated, absolutely it can work really well. Uh, the experience of the NDIS, there's so many stories. We h held a whole bold thinking series event on the NDIS about 18 months ago. It was incredible, incredibly well attended and uh, the range of experiences was extraordinary and everybody has their own story. So I want to hear your stories. Mandy, where are you at with the um, NDIS? 
Do you want to think? No. Um... I'm getting a, a lot of support at home to do my dishes and clean the garden and um, take me to wherever I'd like to go and have a carer come with me. I've got as much support as I could possibly imagine with that. Um, I've been in a hook for a month now because my right hand uh, has died and I need a new set of hands, like this hand is, is due to be replaced. Um, so my my hands are 21 grand for a set of two, and I've been funded $1,700. So I don't quite know how this is going to work. There's a lot of reports that have been written by my prosthetist, and um, I think that now needs to be taken up levels of assessment teams and all sorts of things. So. Um, yeah, I, I so don't. So yours is a story of frustration with the NDIS. I think it's more that nobody quite understands how to work it. Yeah, I, I, I wouldn't say it's frustration because I'm, I'm yet to be denied it. Um, just everyone around me doesn't quite know to ha how to ensure that my hands will be available as soon as possible. So, you, you, from a, you know, from the other side of the, of the story, the clinician side and, and the service delivery is a problem across the whole sector. And I hear lots of stories mm. in, in our experience that the, the huge demand for the NDIS. Uh, means that there aren't clinicians and, and therapists for a whole range of people's experiences that because just we haven't trained enough people to cope with the demand. Mm -hmm. Is that a similar thing that we're seeing here in, in uh, the experience of people who need prosthesis? Yeah, I don't think it necessarily comes down to there being a lack of clinicians available. I think there's a lack of um, people within the NDIS who are kind of at the pivotal point of needing to make the decision in order to allow funding to be provided to Mandy. Um, they're, they're in a very, very important, serious position um, and a lot of the times we're finding that the communication or the understanding, I suppose, that interpretation of my job as a clinician is to put a case forward on Mandy's or the user's behalf um, to say these, this is our full assessment, this is what we need um, for Mandy in order for her to achieve goal X, Y, Z. So is it also an, uh, an extension of what we talked about before, that the people making those decisions have not got a sophisticated understanding of what Mandy's or Priscilla's Spot needs on. are? Spot like on. the simple things like doing the ATM Spot or putting a bra on. That, that's Spot on. Yeah. And even you, it, what I'm finding is that even you're putting those things, and they're set up, uh, NDIS is very good, they're setting up things in that it's very um, goal-driven, goal-orientated, so... Mandy could have put, so I'm using you no, directly as an example, <laughs> Mandy could have used that as, as a very specific goal. I want to be able to go to an ATM and get money out myself. And so my job as a clinician is to try and say, okay, well, what prosthetic devices are going to allow Mandy to be able to do that? And then on the other, the, the other side of the um, is what other therapies does, or what other supports does Mandy need in order to be able to achieve that, to learn how to use that device in order to be able to do that particular task. And I think what's happening is that we can do a... I feel like I do a very good job in presenting that case forward to the NDIS, but whoever is sitting on the other side of the desk picking up that piece of paper who probably doesn't know anything about prosthetics or anything about disability, maybe, um, gets to make that decision and apply funding based on their interpretation of it. So it's a so lottery. It's, it's a lot. Oh, it's a, the inconsistencies mm. are frustrating. Yep. Has that been your yep. experience, Priscilla? Uh, definitely. Um, I I have a love hate relationship with the NDIS. <laughs> I think that it's got incredible potential to transform um, twenty percent of Australians' lives. Like mm. you know, twenty percent of people Family. live with disability, right? Yeah. So, at the very core of it, uh, um, like Monique was saying, like the planners. And the, the turnover of staff is actually one of the biggest problems. Um, so you can't build a relationship with someone. It who, can be who really hard. Yeah. Mm. yeah. And so building that relationship um, with somebody over a period of years is actually really difficult because you're in this for life and they might be in it for a year or two and move on, um, which is absolutely their right, but you're still sitting there and um, sometimes empty-handed. Um, but I would say for people who are amputees, 
if you're not getting the technology that you and your clinician think, make sure you engage with organisations like Limbs for Life because they can also help advocate on your behalf and guide you through that. The biggest thing you need to do is advocate and if you don't feel um, strong enough or confident enough to advocate for yourself, you need to reach out to an organisation that can help yep. you. Um, because I, I've had conversations, like people call me, I have no idea who they are. Um, none of what they tell me makes sense when they ring up, but they've got my file, my life story. And some of the stuff that goes into your plan is incredibly personal. Mm -hmm. And there's this stranger on the phone saying, can you explain how a leg works? And I'm like, can you? <laughs> because this is embarrassing. You're about to sign off on mm. how... So it's disempowering all over again, How much, it? yeah. So luckily for me, I can have that conversation and explain components and why I need this and why I'm about to this particular foot and this, 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 this. And there's not enough people who can do that. And I can do that because of being an amputee for a long time, but all of the other work that I've done has taught me about actual prosthetics and technology. So, and I really, my heart goes out to anybody else who gets that call that can't have that conversation because yeah. they might not be at the same point that I am at the end of that call to be really confident that they're yeah. going to get what's been requested. And Michael, this is the a wider view of the NDIS, but it certainly applies to this situation that advocacy is everything. And in that sense, the, the whole institution, the NDIS, is, is purpose-built for middle-class English-speaking uh, predominantly Anglo people who can navigate bureaucracy, can understand the language, have good advocacy skills. If you're outside of that parameters, if you're English as a second language, socioeconomically challenged, profoundly disabled and you can't advocate personally for yourself or have somebody who can do all those things, you're starting from a long way back. Yeah, you've absolutely hit it on the head. Um, uh, I think it's a real challenge and then uh, part of that challenge doesn't just stem from the people, um, say, who are... Um, assessing claims within the, or requests within the NDOs, but it comes right back to the people um, who are facilitating conversations about planning um, and, and how, how meaningfully can people facilitate conversations about what your needs might be um, in a workforce that's largely untrained in, uh, in disability. Um, so, the, the, you know, we have a profound shortage of people who can really facilitate uh, meaningful plans, um, people who can translate those plans into a language that complies with the, the act that underpins the NDIS, um, and then people who can uh, know enough, say, about prosthetics or wheelchair use or to really be able to help uh, um, people frame what those goals might be um, so that they have something meaningful to um, have a funder then consider. So. Do you mind uh, if I, sorry, I just want to add, uh, there was a question earlier about funding, Francis, that you asked, and I think that in my experience working in Victoria um, as a service provider, there's always been a two-tiered approach to prosthetic service provision. You have on one hand, um, you know, third-party insurance, TAC work cover, mm -hmm. um, and then you have public department, which is, was the Victorian Artificial Limb Program, um, and now you're getting NDIS coming sort of more nationally and hoping that we're going to see... An, al an alignment so that it, the public, people losing their limbs and being funded under public shouldn't have to be denied the same sort of techno technology or access to the same technology as someone that's had a car accident. Yeah, and that's always been the case. But is the great fear that as budgets shrink and you know, we're living in a time where a government is d determined to produce a budget surplus as a <laughs> revenue base shrinks and the mm. demands in the NDIS grow bigger and bigger and the cost base of that grows you know, larger and larger, that there are going to be attempts to try to dampen people's expectations of what they should expect the NDIS delivers for them, particularly if they are in need of expensive technology in mm. order to, you know, possibly, live the life that they want to live. Possibly, and I, but I hope not because, you know, I don't, I don't see providing um, sort of this te technology as necessarily above and beyond what someone needs. It just is what they need. Yep. You know, it's not... We're not sort of reaching further than what, you know, they should have. It's it's about coming up into 2019, moving into 2020 and accessing the technology that is currently available to people across the world. And, yep. and that's an interesting point, isn't it? Because what it then leads back to, Mandy and Priscilla, is the thing that you both talked about is the power of you know, united advocacy amongst people with shared experience to make sure your voice is heard in that conversation. Yeah. Um, 
Yeah, well, in our quad squad, we've yeah. got, um, I can think of four quadruple amputees that are basically exactly the same length in their amputations, and our packages are vastly different mm -hmm. by, by the tens of thousands mm -hmm. of dollars. You know, I've, um, you know, one of our quadruple amputee I'm in touch with has a $20,000 package, and another quad amp is a $150,000 package. Mm. So I have you, you guys must have had a conversation around what the difference was in, in experiences in, in the interface with the NDIS that delivered such wildly different outcomes. Yeah, it? and it comes down to that uneducated person mm. who did the assessment. How, how informed the lottery. The planner, yeah, it? it's a lottery. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. So can yeah. I, can oh. I just pick up, Francis? I think yeah. you know, one of the challenges um, uh, for, for certainly the, the prosthetics community and for um, the NDIS is about how you make um, informed decisions about which technologies you you do fund. Um, and we actually have very little research that looks at the cost effectiveness of, of lots of the technologies that the NDIS is then having to make decisions about. Um, so, you know, there are, there are certainly studies that look at the cost effectiveness of a, say, microprocessor prosthetic knee. Um, but those have historically been provided to people in our community who um, are, are young and active and, you know, who can walk at a wide variety of speeds. Um, but as the literature develops, what we're increasingly seeing is um, some of the people who have potential to benefit most of that technology are really um, older people who are at risk of falls. Mm -hmm. um, and that's, that has to... And once we have good evidence to indicate that absolutely these technologies are cost-effective at mitigating the risk of falls for people, um, I think what, you'll, what we'll see is that that transition will happen. But it's, it's a long history of, you know, new tech, expensive tech uh, is only suitable for you know, young, fit people who um, have capacity to, you know, do lots of different things. Let's talk about technology in the future and where this might be going. We talk about 3D printing and we'll talk about that, no doubt, uh, in our question and answer session as well. But what is the next step, Monique? What, what, what are the next bold frontiers? Are we at the point of uh, the $6 million man? Is he, is, is he around the corner, the idea that we... I like to think of the $6 million woman. Well, there was. Yep. Jamie yep. Wagner, I remember well, <laughs> childhood television show. It's, it's The it's bionic man and or woman. And or woman. Um, it's an exciting space. I mean, it's the technology that um, is currently available and also the technology that's pending. You know, you see, um, always keep my eye on what's, what's coming out of DARPA and, you know, a lot of the research institutes over in the States and, and um, worldwide and... It is. It's exciting. I mean, I'm very fortunate. Promotion working, we're very closely um, working with the surgeons at the Alfred and um, amazing therapists at Epworth uh, in a program that um, we're looking at osseointegration, but also... Well, tell us what that is. Osseointegration. That's been around for a while. It's, um, so basically, it's a surgical procedure that puts an, uh, a titanium implant into the bone. Um, and then that acts as a direct attachment for the processor. So you, you eliminate the need for a socket. Um, so that's, that's one way. That's one way of attaching the leg uh, or the arm. Um, but we're also looking at targeted, another surgical procedure, which is targeted muscle re-innovation. Um, and that's basically allowing upper limb amputees to get a much more natural or intuitive control of their prosthetic limb. Um, so it's it's a really exciting space, and then also what's coming ahead, you know, coming um, not far away is um, things like targeted sensory reinnovation. So actually getting a sensory feedback from the prosthetic limb. So the technology would have sensors. So you're picking up something. So Mandy doesn't have that perception, doesn't have that sensation. So she's holding something. So to be able to have some form of feedback onto her residual limb. Then that gives her some, you know, gives her better control of the, of the prosthetic limb. Do you, does that excite you, those? Well, no, because at the moment I can turn things in a fry pan and I can't feel it. <laughs> 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 you just have to be able to turn it off, I suppose. <laughs> there is that, I guess. <laughs> do, just on the sort of philosophical side of it, do you consider uh, your uh, prosthesis body parts or just? Oh yeah, these tools? are mine. These are me. Yeah. Um, Yes, okay, so that, that's an interesting question and that's something I've been um, tossing about at the moment. So to me, when I come home, I take it all, I take the top half off. Yep, I just take off my arms, I leave them on my bed, I take off my hook unless I'm at the computer. Or at the saucepan. Or at the fry pan, yeah. yes. <laughs> um, and I put them on to do things and then I'll take them back off again. So originally when I first got my prosthetic hands, I put them on in the morning and I took them off at night and I was in them all day, every day. 
and then I sort of worked out what what these things can do. You know, they can't do everything. Um, and I worked out that if I actually took them off, there were some things I could do better. Like what? Um, oh, God. Okay. Like opening a jar is actually easier with my stumps than with these things. That I can open a jar with my hands. I have yet to learn how to open a jar with this. I have no idea how to do it. Um, but, you know, if, if I'm set up like this, I can't really open a jar. So I'll just take them off and I'll do my arms instead and then I'll put them back on again. So at the moment, I'm using these as tools. Um, originally, I started, they were my body parts. What about you, Fred Priscilla? Yeah. How do you feel about your leg? Is it because you had such a special relationship with your old leg? <laughs> do you have a relationship with this one? Um, yeah, it's a great leg. Um, I put it on in the morning and take it off at night. Yeah. Um, if I am sitting watching a movie in the cinema, just like someone might kick off their shoes, I kick my leg off and... And then people trip and I say sorry and it happens all the time. Um, but sometimes I do that. Long, long drives, I pop my leg off and throw it in the back. I got pulled over once and, and the police officer was like, can you get out of your vehicle? I'm like, just one moment, thank you. I'll just put my leg back on. It was quite funny. Um, but yeah, it's part of my body very much. So, um, And for me as well... Um, wearing my prosthesis all the time and walking as much as I can really helps with things like phantom pain and phantom yeah. sensation. Um, and I, I really believe in that. The more that you walk, the, the better that you can feel. It's not the same for everybody, but for me it is. So, yeah, it's part of my life. Would you embrace a new technology that merges biology with mechanics? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Sometimes people ask, like, oh, wouldn't it be great if your leg could grow back? And I think, oh, what if it grew back the same? I already chopped it <laughs> off once. <laughs> like, I, I just don't know if there's a guarantee on that. Because imagine, I'd be like, oh, my God, i got to cremate it again. But, um, <laughs> so, but it, you know, I think my dream is something like the Terminator leg. If, you know, we're going to get down yeah, into the Instagram do land, where it is integrated, it's bionic, and there's, you know, skin over the top and everything like that. I think that that would actually be incredible. And, uh, you know, who knows when and where that will happen, but I do see at some point in our future, however far away that is, how many generations, that that's, you know, something that it might look like. Um, which, you know, there's things now where it's about USBs into bones yeah, yeah. and um, some of the technology about... Um, you know, how they're working on the sensory stuff is fantastic. And I would say Instagram is actually one of the most interesting places to follow technology. So what's going on there for, for people who use pr and, and live with prosthesis as, you know, it, it, uh, crucial to their lives? Well, it's amazing. Uh, there's, it's, it's an online voice for so many people um, to share their experiences and what they're doing. And... Um, and it's also a really great way, social media, just like Mandy was talking about, to meet people and make friends all around the world. Um, I think it's also a really inspiring place for um, cosmesis and, and what's happening. Um, and the technology, just following different hashtags, prosthetics, prosthetic legs, prosthetic technology, you do get some really weird, um, like, movie prosthetic stuff in your feed, though, like uh, weird noses and scars and things that people are doing for sci-fi stuff <laughs> so you just keep scrolling past that um but it is really it's a really great place to see and my poor prosthetist I'm sending him stuff on Instagram <laughs> going I want this he's like stop Instagramming <laughs> but it's it is a really great place and sometimes the technologies aren't real mm. and it's an idea or it's a prototype but it's exciting that people are out there thinking and inventing and being creative um, and it's a way for also amputees to give that feedback like we were talking about before, what you mentioned where um, engineers, designers, amputees, we all need to talk to each other. Mm. Gone are the days of an engineer developing something and a prosthetist making it and you getting it. It's actually now, and social media has opened up that dialogue and the technology is great, yeah. And, and the one thing that it's also done is that I think previously... It seems that if you were incapacitated in any way, um, whether it was with uh, with your limbs or intellectually or you'd suffered an accident, that um, somehow people presumed your creativity was gone as well, but mm. you were just a patient now and you weren't a whole person. But you've clearly shown in your artwork that that's not the case. Um, and yeah. but what's that done for the people that have lived with prost uh, prosthetics and prosthesis to see that you could 
do this, you are a creative person, that there is a, a way to express who you are and your experience through you know, something as intimate as, as your prosthesis? Uh, I think any open and positive conversation about disability life in general is really important. Um, and, and if you can find someone talking specifically about your experience, and in this case amputees and being a prosthetic wearer is so important. And, um, and you know, with... Um, I'll just hold this up so everyone can see this. this. So this is not my actual artwork, but it's from an exhibition that I curated. This is a Queensland artist, Erica Gray. So I collect old limbs and give them to artists to use as their canvas. I love this guy. He sits in my house near the door and welcomes people and terrifies them. Um, he's very lovely. And uh, But through that process, I mean, I started it as a creative fun thing to do. Um, because sometimes you just need a hobby. Yeah. And, uh, and it turned into this open and positive conversation where lots of people have, you know, expressed gratitude and said, oh, you know, I remember one lady said, you know, I'd never talked to anybody at my work ever about being an amputee. And I think, oh, God, that's all I ever talk about. My leg's <laughs> over there and I'm typing here and, you know, whatever. It's summertime and it's too hot. And uh, But she said she'd worked there for, you know, years and years and had never had a conversation. And someone saw an article in the paper about my exhibition and took it in and showed her. And the first time ever she had a conversation in her workplace. That she was acknowledged that that was her experience. And, um, and I, that just, that's so beautiful because, you know, that, that person's work life, a third of her life, opened up a dialogue about the yep. rest of her life um, because of a bit of artwork. Mm -hmm. So, and I think that artwork relaxes people. Like I was talking about the $5 piece of fabric. Um, colour changes people, it relaxes people, it opens the conversation. Being louder and prouder, um, people are less afraid mm. of saying the wrong thing, perhaps, because I think sometimes people hold back and taboos built out of fear. Of, of saying or asking the wrong thing. And Mandy, I mean, these are amazing, uh, the, the ones you've just got. How long have you had these ones for? These? Oh, about three weeks. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but how, how, it's been a journey for you to get to a point where you, you felt like you could walk in the world w with these on. So how does it yeah. feel now to to be at that point where you, you, know, you can... On good days, I feel comfortable with it. Yeah. And on bad days, I get very angry. Yeah? Yeah. Angry about what? Um... People staring. I just, I'm yet to sort step. of step above their stares and go, I'm okay with all this. So, you know, we were at the market with the kids all of a week ago and um, I had, I've got a white pair of, of these covers and I had them on and you can't miss them. They're like, they glow in the dark almost. And everybody stared. And so, you know, some of the stairs are comfortable stairs. You know, people sort of go, oh, wow, well, look, look at them. And other stairs, they're just like, oh, you know, the reaction that you get from people is so varied and if you're not in the right headspace to deal with that reaction can be really difficult. Hmm. Um, you know, if you're having a bad day, like, you know, yeah. I can tell you, pulling up my underpants is a real challenge sometimes and that can just ruin you. Like, just, you know, to, to have something that seems so simple can be such a frustration and then you go out and there's people staring. It's like, oh, you just want to just growl at them. Um, so really, it's it's an ongoing day to day kind of. But challenge. on your good days, yeah. What do you dream of? What do you hope for? Oh, I don't know. I haven't got that far. <laughs> uh, I have learnt that my life, um, literally, six years ago. Sorry, my, six years ago, my life changed in an instant. Yep. So I don't really look very far ahead anymore. Yep. Um, I can look for look to Christmas. At the moment, yep. that'll do me. <laughs> yeah, um, one thing I always say to the quadruple amputees, um, they always say, you know, my last surgery is next week. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm finished up, my last surgery is next week. And I always say to them, no, it's not. You're going to have this for the rest of your life. This is going to be an ongoing thing. Um, so, you know, I, I don't look that far ahead anymore. It's just this week's doing really well. <laughs> <laughs> That'll do. <laughs> That'll do. That'll do. In, indeed it will, and hopefully you have a great Christmas as well. Yeah, cheers. <laughs> uh, we're done up here. Can you give our, uh, wow. our panellists a, a round of applause? <laughs> and now it's over to you. So we have two microphones, one on either side of, uh, of the aisles. Uh, if you can raise your hand 
uh, and introduce yourself. If you can stand up and ask a question, please do it. It's always good because we are filming this and it will go up on the website and it's easy to identify you. Uh, so yeah, a question, a, a follow-up question and then we move on. No statements, please. Uh, we don't have time for people to do that because we want to get to as many questions as possible. So uh, away we go. I'll take my glasses off so I can see who's going who's gonna to start the bidding up Why the back there. <laughs> Hi, uh, my name's Nathan. Um, one thing I was wondering about, something Mandy touched on a lot, was having to like learn how to do an ATM or learn how to tie a bra, that kind of thing. Um, how did you find that transition between learning how to live in a world that's more designed for able-bodied people? And as a follow-up, um, what do you think could be done to help that transition, either from your clinician or from allied health in general? Uh, so I was able-bodied up until six years ago, and I can tell you the able-bodied world has no idea how good you've got it at all. You have no idea. Um, and it was incredibly eye-opening to discover what life with disability looks like. You know, just a simple door handle, like, oh, and a toilet roll holder. Like, those toilet roll holders are just a nightmare for me. Are they the worst? Oh, I can't stand them. I can't stand them. If there's anybody out there that can design a new toilet roll holder, please, please do so. Um, so I would say to anyone, um, my, what I really promote is please go back to your lives and look at your workplace and see, you know, could you get a door open with your elbows? Um, you know, do you have a step? Do you have plenty of room for a wheelchair to come through? Is there a an office space that has, um, you know, your reception desk, is it up here? You know, um, that's where you guys can, can actually go and have a really big impact. Uh, and then from a cl clinician point of view, yes, okay. Please get people who are living the same experience together in a room. Mm. Yep, stop worrying about privacy. Yep, mm. you've all got patients out there and I know you have in the Bible the the you know allied health Bible it says do not break privacy but get people in a room like let other people watch each other and how they do stuff because that's where the learning's done you know simple things like how do you put a leg on you know um, another amp told me to put a plastic bag over your foot so that you can slide your jeans on simple stuff but you know, that's the sort of things that you learn from being at home and trying it out. So throw the privacy issue out the door and get people together. What about for you, Priscilla, in terms of what maybe was? I love the plastic bag there. Yeah. It's great. I don't often have to use it, but it's actually a really good tip. Um, I really agree with what Mandy said, um, and I think that's where organisations like Limbs for Life can come in to help as well, um, where if you don't know anybody um, else you can meet some peer support volunteers and they'll match you up. Um, because the experiences Mandy and I have had are completely different. Um, and unless I was the last amputee on earth, I wouldn't be a peer support volunteer sent to talk to Mandy, mm -hmm. unless perhaps it was a uh, body image thing to talk about. But generally, I'll support people who are below the knee amputees and usually women. And more often than not, when it's elective surgery, which is uh, frighteningly common in Australia um, for lots of different reasons, but they would partner Mandy with another quad and, um, and hopefully a woman and because we have different experiences. And then there's elective versus trauma. Very, sometimes I, uh, you know, I'll meet somebody such as Mandy and go, oh, I don't know how you woke up without your limbs. And, and then Mandy might say to me, I don't know how you ever decided to do that. And so they're very different experiences and allied health professionals need to really recognise that as well, and that's really important. It's part of the conversation, um, and it's a part of your life forever. Great answer. We've got some more questions from the floor. Uh, my name's also Nathan, so I don't know how many questions you're going to get. Um, <laughs> my question is about the word amputee. Mandy and Priscilla, you're using it. Um, uh, I think Monique said prosthetic user, and Francis, you said person living with an amputation. Um, there's lots of words like amputee that we used to use, that we don't use anymore. Where, can you tell me whether as an able-bodied person I can use that word? Um, what do you think amputee. of it? Yeah. <laughs> I know um, I had an interesting conversation actually at Latrobe with a um, congenital um, mm. 
limb loss individual. So I, I don't know what you call her. Yeah. A person living with that limb loss. Yeah. <laughs> she was born without hands and feet and she hated being called an amputee because yeah. yeah. she's not. She, she was born that way. Um, yeah. And she took great... Um, what's the word? She, she was Umbridge. pissed off yeah. by you referred to her that way. So... Oh. And I think that's part of the reason why I do yep. talk about amputees quite a lot. But as far as someone using a prosthesis, I would say a prosthetic user because I have a, some clients that aren't amputees, but they need they use a prosthetic leg or a prosthetic arm. So I think that's kind of where my angle comes from. Um, but, yeah, I think it's a common... And stump is another one, residual limb. I don't know, some mm. people hate it, some people I don't, don't like care. Stump. Yeah, But yeah. ask the person, yeah. what, what would you yeah. like me to refer to you as? <laughs> um, I agree, like amputee is not a dirty word, but not everybody is an amputee. Um, people living with limb difference, limb loss, just ask them. Um, and not all amputees wear prosthetics, so that's the other difference as well. Um, especially upper body, there's a lot of um, amputees who don't wear um, a prosthesis. So sometimes, depending on the context, we might say, because we're talking about amputee life, but then there's the other side is prosthetic life, and, and they don't always cross over. So would you agree with that? Yeah, yeah. yeah I, think I, I, I would wholly support that idea if I, I think you really need to talk to people about mm. um, what sits comfortably with them because there are such diverse um, views. I think it's really difficult. But it comes back mm. to the, the issues that you've talked about a number of times here is breaking through that barrier of taboo, being prepared to ask and learn and understand rather than assume. Well, there's so many um, new labels in our world as well and we talk about this with... Um, uh, p how people may identify as non-binary and, and it's opening up more conversations, it goes exactly the same into the disability world. There are some people who use a wheelchair who, um, if you say wheelchair bound, will run over you and so they should because you should never say that. But there are other people who go, yeah, look, I don't really care, but if you could just use my name and not my you know, wheelchair status, that would be great. So it's about don't be afraid. Just say to people, um, you know, I want to have a conversation with you about your wheelchair how do I refer to it, you know, and, and what language are you comfortable with? And more often than not, people will appreciate that or they'll just go, yeah, whatever, I don't care, so... Yeah. But do you yeah. get sick, Mandy, of having to tell people what happened to you? Do people... Is it, is it often the first thing that some people say to you? What happened to you? I had it uh, about a week ago. Um, he didn't even say hello. He Total just, stranger? Or? Yeah, oh, well, we had a mutual friend that introduced me. Um, so yeah, it was a total stranger, but I yeah. walked straight in and he just went, what happened to your arms? It wasn't a hi, how are you, you know, welcome or anything like that. <laughs> May just, I buy you dinner? What happened to your arms? Nothing. Did you say, what, what um, happened to your face? No. And... <laughs> <laughs> I should... <laughs> yes, yes, no. I was, I was trying to be polite. <laughs> um, but I, I heard you on the radio the other day and you said, asking people what was the most traumatic day of your life, it's, that's what it's like. Mm. like it, and again, it's, it's up to you whether or not you're having a good day. Yeah. Um, and I don't mind. Like, you know, I, my answer to him was I got sick and my hands and feet got chopped off. He hadn't even noticed that my feet were gone. I was like, oh. <laughs> um, you're like, hold my beer. There's more. <laughs> 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 yes, but... You know, let's just get straight to the point. Yeah, sure, I've had my hands and feet chopped off. Can we move on? Can yeah. we, oh, look at the shop. We're but I'm know. more than yeah. what I'm not. Yeah, um, and that's... I I'm got to that point. I want to be more than just this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Fair enough, too. Uh, any questions? Any more questions from the floor? There's another question up the back here, arm um, in the air. Hello, my name is not Nathan, so I'm breaking with tradition. Thank you so much for sharing tonight. My name is Renee. Um, I have a question around two themes that you picked up, specifically talking about pity and shame. And I was struck, Mandy, by your story about walking through the market and wishing people that weren't, were not staring at you. And I was reflecting as you were talking on, for myself, how, w how would I change my response or ha how do I change my track of thinking as an able-bodied person who has that reaction of pity, which is, um, can be a natural response. It may come from a place of curiosity or interest not necessarily wanting to draw attention, but it's it's a place that that we go out of curiosity, and I'm wondering if um, either Priscilla or Mandy could could I guess coach us on how to train our thinking away from if that is our natural response or inclination to stare or give attention in a way that's unhelpful. How how can you coach us to 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 improve in that or change our thinking? Um. 
Well, I guess, you know, what Mandy was saying earlier about some days you just, it's just don't stare and you have, you just don't want anyone to, I call them jean days where I, I'm, I, I'm in a position where I can put my jeans on and walk down the street and no one will know. Um, so my challenge is to people, you know, most amputees are really open and we're more than happy to share our stories. But I challenge you to ask us everything except what happened. And Mandy touched on that just before as well, where when you do walk up to somebody in the street and you ask them, I get it at crossing the lights, in the lift, in taxis, like small places where you're alone with people and they don't ask your name, nothing, they just say what happened. You don't walk up to anybody else and say, can you tell me about the most traumatic experience you've ever had in your life? And, and keep that in mind. Feel, think about how you might feel if someone's asking you that. So there, as you've learnt tonight, there are so many more interesting things you can talk about with an amputee. You can comment on our legs and say, hey, your legs are really beautiful. And in the same way that you might tell someone you really like their jacket that they're wearing. Um, and if that opens up a conversation between you and the stranger, that's really nice and go with the flow, but don't push it. Um, and I think that, you know, don't be shy from talking to people, always say hello, but just be really conscious and use your manners and think about how someone might feel and think about what the context is. So when you do ask somebody what happened, you might be asking them about the worst day of their life and how you might feel about reliving that particular trauma time and time again with complete strangers on the street. So, Men? can I add, um, my husband t used to teach philosophy, so he has an answer. Whenever somebody says to me, oh, you know, what happened? And I say, I, ha I lost my hands and feet. And he goes, they will say, oh, I'm really sorry. And Rod always turns around so, and says, why? Was it you that did it? <laughs> like, you know, I'm okay with this. Like, yeah, okay, this event happened. It was crap. That's fine. I've actually had a really good life ever since. And my life now is actually incredibly vibrant and brilliant. Um, so don't assume that having your hands and feet chopped off is actually a bad thing. Like, this is just a thing. It, it just happened. It's not a good, or a good thing. It's not a bad thing. It's just an event. And, you know... Life goes on. It looks it different. On. Looks different. Looks better, to be honest. <laughs> yeah. My legs way better than don't, your hairy ones. Don't pity us. Yeah. <laughs> that wouldn't be hard. No, but I completely agree. And the pity thing is, and the staring is really interesting as well. Some Don't ever discourage your children from having a look or asking a question. Um, kids can ask me anything they like. Adults, I might be like, hmm, I don't know. Yeah. But I always want kids <laughs> to ask and learn. Yep. And I would always prefer somebody ask me a question rather than make up an assumption. Yeah, and, and as long as you do it with manners. Manners, manners. Manners are wonderful things. Mm. Yeah. Oh, they're, they're for free too, it's amazing. Mm. Have we got some more questions? Another question down the front. Thank you. Uh, my name's Frank. I've got a, the word technology has been used a lot, and uh, so I kind of wondered if you might, if someone might like to speak about the limitations of technology, say in the short to medium term. It's kind of hard to think beyond that. Um, when people talk about three D printing, you know, it's I can imagine people trying to imagine taking a photo of something, feeding it into some scanners, and you know, a product being produced. I mean, so what are the limitations of technology um, and, uh, you know, because people sort of have these expectations and mm. uh, images of what's possible and then perhaps mm. they're quite unrealistic. Michael, would you like to deal with that one? Oh, it's a tough question. Um, <laughs> um, it's a really hard question to work out how to answer. Um, I, I think absolutely there are limitations to technology. Um, I think some of the challenges that we have is um, is to work out. Uh, so some of the challenges are absolutely are very technical. Um, Monique mentioned uh, earlier about a, a, a process called targeted muscle reinnovation, um, and there are some very clever technologies now that um, where you can have an Im uh, an electrode that's embedded within the muscle that can then uh, provide a Bluetooth signal. Um, so when the muscle contracts and there's an electrical current, it can get captured and amplified and Bluetoothed uh, out through the skin into a receptor in the prosthetic socket. So there are absolutely technical challenges to solve, like how do you get enough bandwidth um, uh, in that sort of technology to be able to drive uh, um, a prosthetic hand with, with that basically has every joint that, that can move and do that simultaneously. 
Um, and I've no doubt, given the way technology has changed over you know, the last 20 years, that those sorts of technical challenges will increasingly get resolved over time. Mm -hmm. um, I think there are other real challenges, and I think many um, of the panelists here talked tonight about making, uh, you know, how do you fund that sort of technology? And for whom do we make, as a community, who do we make decisions about uh, which technology is, is, is suitable for, for which people? And I think those are real challenges that, um, increasingly we have to work through is, is uh, you know, the, the technology is great, but I think as Mandy pointed to is, um, you know, the technology can be expensive. And then um, as a, a socialised um, health service or as a user, um, how do you make decisions about um, what technology you pay for and as a community we choose to fund? And I think those are really difficult questions. Yeah, it's an interesting point because we could get to a situation where we have almost a caste system for, for av available access, depending on who can afford to pay. Mm. And, and a, phil a philosophical decision to make it available to everyone is extremely expensive. So, yeah. how, how are we going to navigate that? <laughs> <laughs> Come and eat, answer that question. Well. Ian, 30 seconds, go. <laughs> um, look, I, I don't know. I don't know what the answer to that question is. But certainly as, um, as a prosodist that, um, you know, I'm, I think we're very fortunate here in Australia is that we, we are sort of getting access to a lot of the technology that's available, commercially available, um, even though we're a relatively small country, population-wise, where you know the, we're accessing upper limb components at the forefront, you know, um, before some of the bigger countries, and um, so. But there are limitations to that, and I think that as a service provider, my job is to work with a client to um, manage their expectations about what um, you know. If I take the example of a prosthetic arm, I think. Everyone sees and hears these robotic hands, these bio, you know the myoelectric hands, and you know um, articulated movements and multiple grip patterns. And but really, when you think about it, the limitation is it still is far from replacing what your actual hand does. Mm. So that's a massive limitation. And and you know technology-wise and development-wise, it's it's things are moving and it's a really great space to work in. But the expectation of a new prosthetic user, um, it's my job to sort of go, oh, yeah, okay, <laughs> here's the, here's the here's deal. The <laughs> here's the reality of it. Um, so there is a limitation, and I think that, um, uh, yeah, development of new technology hopefully will imp keep improving. It will, I'm sure of it. Um, but, yeah, there are definitely... And, and funding is a big limitation, or could be. Many Priscilla, within the communities that, that uh, live with um, and use prosthesis, is there a conversation about equity of access as technologies come online to make sure that people aren't oh, left yeah. behind? Oh, yeah. You know, this hand is a $10,000 hand. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I sat in the back of a taxi with uh, six amputees, and in the back of the cab there would have been a good million dollars worth of hardware. And we all sort of said, well, how's your hand going? And how's my hand going? And just because it's expensive doesn't make it better. Mm. Which I think a lot of the prosthetic... Well, I'm assuming a lot of the prosthetic industry doesn't quite see that. You know, they get excited over the latest technology because you can move your fingers. Mm. But if it breaks every two weeks and it can't hold a shopping oh. bag, mm. what's the point? Yeah. Um, yeah, so in the back of this taxi, we all had a chat about every one of us had a different... Um, prosthetic hand on and they were all from the cheapest to the most expensive in, on the market and it was interesting how nobody really was happy mm. you know um, and, and again I think that comes back to yeah the, 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 that's us not doing our job right I think or the therapist in that you know working with that client to say okay the expectations of what you're going to be able to do with this is this um, I, th I think it comes down to everybody's understanding of, of you're not going to replace a real yeah. hand. Yeah. You know, it is still something made out of metal and plastic. Mm. It's never going to be what we all expect it to but be. But there is a misalignment of people's expectation about, oh, it costs a lot of money, so therefore it must, it right. must just do everything. Mm. And it must, yeah, yeah. and that's, that's not... And I think in the, right. in the in the conversation about you know how do we how do we fund these I think absolutely central to that um, and in keeping with the NDIS is well, what are the goals that people want to achieve um, and then if you look at how the Commonwealth choose to fund lots of different parts of our healthcare some of it is then about well how can you meet those goals um, uh, in a way that's that's 
uh, at a reasonable price. So, for example, you know, there are, there are contraceptive pills that are absolutely funded by the Commonwealth on the pharmaceutical benefit scheme, but there are other contraceptive pills that they won't fund. And it becomes a decision then about, well, why would we fund this more expensive version when it achieves the same outcomes as, as this one? Um, and absolutely get from a health economic perspective why why you would make that, that choice. Uh, part of the challenge that we have is then working out um, well, what is it that we want the technology to do and what is it that a person needs it to do and, and which of these available options is, is best going to meet that, that person's needs. Um, and that really comes down to, to planning, being clear about the expectations and limitations and helping inform that choice. I have a, another question. Hi, I am Alvaro. Um, I have a question is, instead of looking for a prosthetic that makes everything, would you rather be interested on in doing a prosthetic designed for a specific activity? For example, carry on a bag. We are not talking about $10,000. We are talking about a couple of hundreds. But ha like, move, move on from a, from a concept of something that works for everything to to uh, to an accessory system yeah yes yes i can answer that <laughs> um when i was in hospital my brother said to me you need a set of go go gadget arms that you can pull off a tool and stick another one on and at the moment i'm getting one um, that is a socket and i'm going to have a potato peeler attached to it and i can pull the potato peeler off and i can get a knife put on I can pull that off and I have a golf club holder. I pull that off and I can um, throw a baseball. So, yeah, I, I agree. I think... Um, Who's designing that piece of genius oh, for you? Oh, there's a company over in the States Fantastic. that um, charges fortune for a... <laughs> potato peeler. Potato peeler. <laughs> for a potato. With a sock, you know, a connection here. But We need know. to get into that business. Oh, yeah. you do. Yeah. Yeah. You can so, paint them. Yeah. yeah. I'll make them. Definitely. Yeah. Uh, again, yeah. I think th these things have a limitation, no matter how flash and whiz-bang they are. And if you could set somebody like myself up with literally a go-go gadget set of gadgets that I could click in one, click out the other, click in one, click out the other, you're going to give your amputee so much more yeah. options and things to do. Follow up there? I, I just asked that because I designed more than 10 years ago a prosthetic, or I would say an accessory to allow people to play volleyball. But I never had the, like, the opportunity to talk to someone and address it will be something you were interested in or not. Me? Yeah, I'll have one. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, oh, sorry. There's a lot of not-for-profit um, design groups out there that will look at um, taking things like that and designing it and, and making it accessible to people with disabilities. So, so hang about after yeah, we're finished here. Yeah, chat to chat. us. Definitely. Uh, I just wanted to add to that. In the video that we watched earlier, you saw the posty hand. Yep. So this is something that happened years ago um, after the war. Lots of people lost limbs. And the um, amputees would get their socket and a box of about six hands that they could clip on. And because so many were retrained as posties and it was just wood and there was that bolt and it popped in and there was a little wheel under the thumb so you could have a few letters and as you walked along the street, you could pull them out. So they had their good hand, you know, for going to church or to weddings, the hook, a carpentry hand, because it was mostly men and back then everyone built stuff, unlike now we buy it on eBay. Um, <laughs> and and the posty hand and a few things like that and um, and I, I think that should be a thing and and having your potato peeler or whatever it it's is. the same with legs. Like, you'll have a yeah. sport leg and you've got a water leg and you have a walking leg and, you know, I've got a pair of high heel legs. Like, that's... It. Mm. And that's the problem with the NDIS is they want to give you one leg that's going to be your everyday leg. And really, you know, a running blade is vastly different to mm. a water leg. And they're yeah. amazing. And I think something really important to keep in mind, especially going back to your question earlier, um, people have an assumption that disability is always linked to charity what we're talking about is commercial industry. Yeah. This all costs a lot of money um, and we shouldn't um, be too hard on people whose products are expensive because the industry isn't set up for them to be developing them as, as cheap as we want them. And that's something we need to um, you know, work on. But I think there's a huge disparity between perhaps what is available in funding mm. and people's 
thoughts there to what companies are producing and we have to remember that healthcare overall is a commercial business and in Australia we've been very much in denial about that for generations and we think that um, healthcare should be free and, and it's not and it never has been and it certainly isn't now and especially in the world of assistive tech where there's more companies outside of hospitals who are making technology that we want to access. Um, and it will come down to like the car industry and who can afford what at some point. But how does the government um, as a funding source support that better or regulate it where technology is affordable um, but can still progress? There's, that's not there yet, but we have to remember it's a commercial industry in the same sense that Monique works in a commercial industry. You, you have to earn an income. You're not there to donate your time every day. Yeah. Um, and the people who are making the components are in a commercial business as well. Yeah, so, and, and following yeah. on from that, you know, a, a component that is now commercially available in Australia, yes, it might seem expensive, but it hasn't just come from, like, out of nowhere. It's often years, if not decades, of research, development, prototyping, you know, all the hours that have gone into developing that particular piece of equipment to then get it TJA approved and onto the shelves so that me as a prosthetist can um, potentially buy it to then fit it onto a user. So um, it, the cost is there, obviously, because, yeah, there's all of that background, um, you know, hard work and sweat and tears have gone and into regulation. designing. And regulation. Yeah, because yeah. we're also very lucky that in Australia we're supported by legislation that makes sure the components that we're having a um, medical grade, they're being de um, built, put together by formally trained people um, from universities such as La Trobe, we're really, really lucky in that regard. And I think that's really important to keep in mind that none of that comes for free. We've got a, a question from the front bench. Down the <laughs> Hi, I'm Tess. I was just asking that, um, what's the most thing you miss doing, like when you were, when you had arms and legs? Me. What's, what's the biggest thing I miss? Um, I would really like to walk to the top of a hill one day. I miss being able to even think that I could do that. Um, I miss walking. I really miss it. Um, used to live in Melbourne and, you know, just walking, walking, walking would be, would be lovely to do that. Um, besides that, I, I just learned how to crochet. When I lost my hands, I just learned how to crochet and I was getting really good at granny squares. <laughs> and uh, now I cannot do it at all. So, yeah, it's all, it's all sorts of little things. That's crochet really beautiful, me. Mandy, because I was going to say I really miss when you wake up in the middle of the night really sick, like with gastro, and you have to put your leg on to get to the <laughs> toilet. I miss being able to just run to the toilet. I really mean that. I know that sounds a bit gross, maybe an overshare, but you have to, you know, <laughs> stop and put your leg on and you're panicked, and it could be in any scenario when you're actually sick and you need to get somewhere. That is something I... It's the only thing I really miss. <laughs> I'm sure there's a more beautiful answer in there somewhere, but it's needing to spew and getting somewhere. <laughs> Yeah. We have time for, for one more question <laughs> to finish off uh, our conversation here tonight. Uh, hi, uh, my name's Chris. Uh, Manu Priscilla, thank you. Uh, whilst we're on sort of these functional limitations that you have, um, I wanted to ask if either of you have uh, pain issues related to your limbs and how that factors in your day-to-day -day management and your treatment needs. So, Mandy, how are you at the moment? Um, pretty good. I don't really get phantom pain and again I think it is because um, I immediately started moving fingers and toes when I had them chopped off. Um, so I again recommend that to your patients. Um, socket. Yeah, if you don't fit a socket to my leg and I'm on it, it will hurt and it will be so limiting. So, you know, a decent, a decent socket um, is the difference between me being able to do a, a full day on my legs or half an hour. Um, and it's the same with my arms. So um, I have a bone here that sits right on my socket uh, and it has taken my prosthetist years to get it to the point that I don't always have a pressure sore there. So, um, yeah, a good socket fit is a wonderful thing. It's nothing without that. You can have the best looking leg ever, but if it doesn't feel good and you can't keep it on all day, there's no use. 
It may as well just be a piece of artwork on the wall. Um, it has to feel great first and foremost. Um, I have phantom sensation 100% of the time. So just in my toes, I can always feel it. It's like pins and needles. I forget that it's there and someone says, can you feel your foot? And I'm like, yes, thanks for the reminder. <laughs> and I'll think about it for a little while. I do think it helps me walk. I have a theory behind that because I feel like I have a foot all of the time. Um, I don't get a lot of pain, but if I am in bed for a little while, um, like with a flu or something like that, and you're just lazing about, that's when I start to feel pain. And I've realised that's because my my body just wants to move and as sick as I might be, I just want to do some laps in my apartment to keep walking, to keep tricking my body into thinking it has a leg. And, um, and if I eat too much sugar, worst phantom pain ever. Mm -hmm. So sometimes that last piece of cake and you're like, I'm going to regret this. And sure enough, that night I can't sleep and I'm, <laughs> yeah. So but sugar's really annoying. I don't know if other amputees experience that. But. There's, there's a, I'll just quickly add, I think I have to wrap up. I, um, there's been a really interesting outcome as a result of the um, program that we're involved with through the Alfred um, with the T, uh, the targeted muscle reinnovation TMR surgery. It started by, um, with the main purpose really to um, restore control and more of a natural intuitive control. Um, but what they found is that it also um, had a very significant effect in reducing phantom limb pain. So the program are now actually doing the um, TMR surgery for lower limb to reduced phantom limb pain as well. So you can have Amazing. your cake and, cake and eat it too. Yeah. <laughs> That's so exciting. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, can you thank our panellists for sharing with us tonight? Monique, Mandy, Priscilla and Michael. Thanks to Professor Russ Hoy for introducing us. Um, thank you for coming along. It will be available on the uh, Bold Thinking website. If you want to share with other people who couldn't get here tonight, it'll be up there for you to do that. And uh, stay uh, with your eyes tuned to the uh, the Trobe University website for next year's program of Bold Thinking Series events this is our final one for the year. Thank you to Tanya, thank you to Chris Mackey and the team at La Trobe University and we'll catch you in 2020.